everybody, Jonathan Schmidt here on a nice, beautiful, warm, sunny day here in Texas. Going to give you guys a nice thorough walkthrough right here. It's a 1967 Piper Cherokee. Uh, it is 180 horsepower is what the Cherokee 180 stands for. And uh, I guess we're going to start right here and kind of go around uh, in a circular motion like here. So here in the front, we have our engine cowl. This is the top half. It does separate right here at the line. We have four latches that holds it together. One here in the back, one in the front, as well as two on the uh, adjacent side. Uh, a little bit lower, we have this vent right here in the lower cowl, and that's to give any kind of ram cooling air. There's an electric fuel pump in this area uh, underneath our lower cowl here. Um, a little bit further down from that, we have our gascalator, and the gascalator's job is to separate any uh, fuel contaminants or water. Uh, it's kind of a last stop before that fuel then makes its way into the carburetor to then get burned. Uh, water typically doesn't burn as well as avgas, so that, like I said, we, we draw some, uh, some avgas, and then we look in our little tube to make sure that the water hasn't separated, that the water's not even there to begin with. Uh, we're looking for 100% clean, clear blue uh, is, is the color of avgas, and if we see something other than that, our procedure is we just simply continue to sump more fuel until those contaminants or water have gone away. Uh, so that takes care of that. Moving forward a little bit, you can see these gills here on this panel. That's simply a point for heat extraction to take place. we got this motor inside this cow generating a whole bunch of heat, and we need uh, some areas uh, to be able to evacuate that heat. So that's the gills there. Uh, forward of that, you can see we have this uh, molding here in the lower cow here for our two exhaust pipes to then uh, expel our exhaust gases from our engine after they've been combusted. Uh, probably also there in the shot there, our nose strut. This is what attaches our entire nose wheel assembly to the uh, forward part of the airplane. We have the shiny chrome. This is actually what slides up and down to give you that compressibility effect. We have a rear torque leak there to give you some stability as well as steering control. Uh, something also to note right here is a, a little rubber bumper pad and what that does is when that nose uh, gear does extend fully, we have some uh, effective cushion there. We got this propeller here right here. A lot of people uh, make a little joke and say, uh, this is just nothing but the fan to keep the pilot cool because what happens is if this uh, propeller stops spinning in flight, the pilot starts sweating, right? So that's a little bit of a joke a lot of people like to say. But nonetheless, we have this propeller here. What it does, its job is to spin really fast. And if you look kind of here from the side, you'll see that it's got a twist to it. And so think of a corkscrew, right? You spin this propeller through the air and it's got this nice uh, twist to it. What it's doing is it's producing a certain amount of thrust, a certain amount of lift in that forward direction. So that propeller's job actually is just to simply pull you through the air. And right here at the center hub, we've got the spinner. Um, one thing about the spinner is that not airplanes actually are required to have them. Uh, this one actually, it is listed uh, per the manufacturer. You actually don't have to fly with it. It'd be kind of silly not to though, but typically what its main job is going to do, manufacturers say that its job is to help you deflect uh, the cooling air that we're flying through to deflect that into these large openings right here. And that's the job of these large openings here is to provide cooling air to the engine that's back there. These are air-cooled uh, engines here. We've got this round opening right there. What that's doing is that's going to extract some of that cooling air and feed it to our carburetor in the event we ever were to have uh, icing in the carburetor we have a control inside the cockpit that we we can select to feed heated air uh, into the carburetor to try to melt that ice otherwise uh, what happens is if we've got carburetor ice or engines uh, kind of start running a little bit funky and we lose a little bit of power so that's our safety for that uh, I'll move around a little bit here to the other side just below the spinner here Another point of inspection, uh, we have this LED landing light right there. Um, that's just simply to allow us to see. We can taxi around on the ground uh, at nighttime, as well as see some unlit uh, runways at, at night as well. Um, just below that here, we've got another inlet. Uh, this one right here is actually just gonna feed air directly to the engine air filter. Uh, ideally, air is typically filtered before uh, going into the engine. That's just to prevent sand and dust and other particles from getting inside your engine. So now we've got this upper cowl off to be able to see all the, the brains of the operation, so to speak. Uh, starting here on the firewall right here is this kind of big paneling. That's what separates the engine bay from the, from the cabin or the cockpit, we can call it. Um, we'll go from here forward. So starting off with this black uh, brake cylinder fluid reservoir is what it's going to be. So inside there we have a uh, mil-spec fluid. Uh, it's red in color. Uh, it's important to know that because in the event we have leaks on the airplane, we can simply identify where it's coming from because this will be red. And again, this is uh, equivalent to the brake fluid on your cars. Uh, so fluid is routed from here to your handbrake. Uh, uh, then it's routed to your, your tow brakes we can kind of look at and talk a little bit about later and then eventually to your wheels as a last point uh, of travel for that fluid. Um, this big bright orange uh, hose right here, this is actually going to extract 
some of your heat air and route it right here to your defrost vents. We can actually show in the shot right here. So in the event we have a uh, maybe a frosted over windscreen there, we can pull a, a control lever inside the cabin and be able to reroute some hot air and deflect it on the windscreen so we can see. That's usually an ideal thing when you're flying. Uh, some other hoses we can talk about, these black rubber hoses, these are going to be a vacuum supply. Uh, so some of our gauges in the cockpit here uh, run off a of vacuum and so what happens is we have a vacuum pump. If we follow these black hoses backwards a little bit, they attach right here. And so what happens is anytime the motor is running, that vacuum pump is spinning and creating a whole bunch of suction that is then being routed through a couple of gauges in the cabin. And we'll point those out here in a moment. And what it does is it spins up real fast gyros inside of those and through rigidity and space, now we have a couple of uh, gauges that we can use for, uh, for flight purposes. Uh, some of the other hoses here, we have these orange ones right here that are coated in a orange fire sleeving material. This is just simply for heat protection. This one right here I've got my finger on is routing uh, oil itself to an oil cooler that's actually on that far side. We'll have to point out again once we get over there. Um, so we're going to have a, a supply and a return hose. Just simply provide a means to be able to cool our engine oil. Uh, if we drop down a little bit, we see all these blue wires uh, coming out of this black left-hand magneto. What a magneto does is it's gear-driven with the motor. Anytime this magneto is spinning, there's uh, items in here that create their own magnet uh, magnetism, and then that magnetism is fed through these leads. And if we follow back towards us on this left-hand side, we can follow these blue leads. And what it does is that's what routes our spark and throws it directly into our spark plug. So that's how we, d not only do these planes develop their own spark, but they can also route them to each individual uh, spark plug. So now that we have a magneto that can generate its own spark and deliver it to the spark plug, uh, it's, it's important to note that each cylinder has two sets of spark plugs. And this is for redundancy. Um, another thing to note is um, since we have those dual, dual redundant systems, we can actually select one or the other. Typically we're going to you know, utilize both for redundancy. It also is a little bit of a performance boost as well. So here we pointed out we've got spark plugs here on the bottom of the cylinder. And if we follow up here to the top, we can also see that we have those spark plugs on the top as well. And there is actually a proper rotating process that the manufacturer recommends we do. We uh, take the top from this cylinder maybe and we run it to the bottom on the other side. Anytime these plugs come out for maintenance, there's a rotation um, practice that we can follow. Um, also on this left hand side we can see we've got these uh, these sticks kind of sticking out of these exhaust stacks right here and what that does is that's a probe that's a sensor and what that does is it reads the temperature of the uh, exhaust gases within that tube there and it feeds it through this wiring into an engine monitor that I have on the display there so I can uh, identify any issues or maybe cylinders that aren't burning fully things like that um, additionally we have other sensors that are plugged in uh, here on the bottom we look through we have these uh, other sensors that are threaded in and that's actually to tell us the temperature of the cylinder head itself so two sensors right we've got this one that I got my finger on to tell me the temperature of the head itself and then this sensor that we talked about a second ago to tell us the temperature of the exhaust gas coming out of the engine so both of those are not interconnected like some people think they do peak out of the changes that's another argument we can get into um, moving lower a little bit we have this shrouding right here this uh, stainless steel look uh, look of a metal to it so what that is that that's a baffle it takes, it takes some hot air and it traps it and then it feeds it. The ducting that I got my finger on is then going to route that hot air into the carburetor and that's going to feed our carburetor that hot air we were talking about earlier in the event we suspect any carburetor icing. Um, going back upwards a little bit, what we have right here, it says Avco Lycoming. This is a Lycoming uh, 0360. That is the model of the engine. Like I said, it develops 180 horsepower at 2,700 RPM is its red line. This right here, this uh, kind of shroud that I've got my hand on is the rocker box cover. And what we could do is if we did undo all these screws, we could take these off and see the rocker arms themselves. Uh, that's typically not a uh, common procedure to do. Nonetheless, that is what is underneath all four of these. There's two here and there's two on the other side. That is what's underneath these uh, panels right here. Uh, the black metal here, we're going to call those our engine cooling baffles. That's going to be the structure. Uh, to, what we want to do is trap all this ram air that we talked about that enters the front of our motor right here. We need to trap that and force all that cooling air to go down in between our cylinders for cooling purposes. If we note, uh, we have all these fins right here on each of the four cylinders, one, two, and three, and four. 
we have all these fins on the cooling, uh, the cooling fins on the cylinders, that way we can route that cooling air through it and provide cooling to those cylinders. Sometimes on hot days, it's not quite enough. We're here in Texas, sometimes we're 110 degrees on the ramp, so that can become a challenge. Uh, so with the, with the black paneling here, we also have the orange silicone baffle material, and that's just gonna provide the, um, the last maybe 10% or so. So we can trap most of the air with the black shrouds, but then the silicone is there to provide us that last little bit of capturing of that cooling air here. So if we walk around the other side here, so a lot of this is going to be uh, the same as just the other side. We've got a uh, plug on the top there, plug on the top there. Also on the bottom here, we've got the same plug just like on the other side. Um, these, uh, we've got a blue B nut right there feeding a aluminum tube there. Those are going to be on all four, all four cylinders. What that's going to do is that's going to take our lubricating engine oil from the top end of our engine underneath these rocker box covers and reroute that back to our sump so that the circulation can continue. Now also on this cylinder right here we see this eighth inch copper tubing. What that's going to be for is for engine startup purposes we're going to provide uh, additional shots of fuel to each cylinder for starting purposes and we're going to call that prime the engine with fuel for starting. Uh, we have the same sensors here. We've got our exhaust gas temperature probe there on our rear cylinder as well as our forward and the applicable wiring that feeds that information back to our our, our gauges in the uh, in the cabin there uh, moving up some we've got another very large uh, orange scat hose is what it's called what that does is that takes again more of our cooling air and feeds it right over the top of our uh, engine oil cooler is what that's going to be for and if you remember earlier we pointed out the uh, the hoses that feed that hot and then cooled oil to and from the motor Moving up a little bit, we have our oil engine dipstick. What we would do is uh, every time before we go fly, we're gonna remove this and simply have a way of measuring how much engine oil is in our engine at this time. There we can see we're just a hair below six quarts. This engine does hold eight, and the manufacturer says it is safe to fly all the way down to two quarts. However, that is not a wise idea, and you'll find probably nobody practices on that uh, piece of information right there. We talked about the left hand magneto. Here's the right hand. We talked about how it had redundancy with itself. There's gonna be a left hand and a right hand. So again, these are gear driven within the motor. And as the motor turns, these magnetos generate their own electricity and then route that electricity through this harness, the blue wires, all the way to each of the spark plugs. Another thing that's interesting is one magneto typically can fire the top hand spark plugs on one side of the engine, but they will fire the bottom spark plugs on the other side of the motor. Uh, just past that, we've got our white colored uh, engine oil filter just like our cars, maybe, uh, maybe our tractors and whatnot, we've got a means of uh, filtering our engine oil. We don't want dirty engine oil in these really expensive motors. Um, this one hose right here that protrudes from the left to the right hand side of our firewall and eventually down is a way to extract any moisture that has developed inside of our engine, right? A byproduct of combustion is simply moisture. There's also some acids that get suspended in that, um, in that waste as well, so we need a, a means to be able to extract that. And so what we can see is that this tube is actually gonna be shot straight down out of the bottom of the airplane and as we're flying through the air, that's actually sucked out. So again, that's what we wanna do is, is get rid of those acids. We don't wanna leave those in the engine. And in any extra, uh, for example, if we had a worn out motor, it's gonna create a lot of a lot of uh, blow by as well so it's going to try to pressurize our crankcase this is the means of not blowing up any seals or anything this is a way to get rid of that pressure it's real deep in right here we've got another orange scat hose right here and this again takes some of our um, air and it simply throws it into i'm going to follow it back a little bit into this box here and this box right here also has a small hose coming off of it. This is once again a place for us to take some of the hot air for cabin heating and the defrost. Uh, so in the event we want to fly during the cold you know, weather months, we can, uh, we can take some of the hot air and throw it into the cabin. Uh, a lot of people like to make a note that in the event there is any kind of exhaust leakage, sometimes that can then be um, routed into the cabin and, and there have been events where carbon monoxide poisoning has taken airplanes down. So we try to have digital carbon monoxide detectors inside the cabin at all times that can read at such a sensitive level and be able to provide an alarm to us in the event there's any uh, measurable amount of carbon monoxide present. Um, a little bit adjacent to this orange scat hosing in here. This entire shroud or, or paneling, this box right here, inside of that is our engine air filter. And again, that simply just filters our air before it gets ingested into the motor for combustion. Um, I'm gonna reach in a little bit further to this yellow item right here. Some people may recognize you may have one on your bicycle or your car or your truck. 
Um, that's just simply a uh, protective cap to keep any contaminants out of the uh, Schrader valve that's just below that. What we use that for is to provide um, compressed nitrogen into our front strut that gives us our uh, ability to have a cushioned nose. Um, just behind that, we're going to have this uh, black cylinder right here and what that's going to do is that's going to be filled with nitrogen and oil and that provides a dampening effect to any uh, steering inputs that we can provide. Uh, additionally, if we're uh, rolling down the runway with any kind of speed, sometimes our nose just simply want to shimmy and that's exactly the name of this component is our shimmy damper. And again, that just provides a way to keep our nose wheel from vibrating rapidly left and right. Uh, just beyond that, we're going to have another control rod and what this rod does, we can see it goes and penetrates through the firewall. It also comes forward some and attaches to the steering horn that I've got my finger on. And that is exactly what happens with our feet. We're gonna press on a pedal for steering on the ground. And what it does is it actuates these control rods and turns this entire steering horn to then turn our wheel left and right. Starting from the wing root here on our way out, we can see this mesh material right here. There's kind of a slot cut out in the leading edge of the wing right there. And what that is there for the mesh, of course, is to keep any kind of bugs, critters uh, out, of, out, of, out of the inside of the wing. But that slot is there to route any kind of ram air into the cabin for cooling purposes. These airplanes do not have air conditioning. That is our air conditioning. It's just like opening your window going down the highway in your old Chevy pickup. Um, moving out a little bit further, we have a row of screws here going back across and then back to the front. So that's gonna be our entire fuel cell right here. Um, this fuel cell, each wing can hold 25 gallons total. Um, all of that is not usable. And what I mean by that is when you run your tanks dry, uh, the engine cannot pull every single gallon out of each tank. And so what the manufacturer tells us is that there's one gallon on this side, and there's also a tank on the left-hand side as well. There's one gallon of unusable fuel as well. So there's 50 gallons total. We have two gallons unusable. So we have 48 usable gallons, and we just simply need to know that for flight planning purposes. Nobody likes to run out of fuel in the, in the, in the sky, right? Um, we have a placard here. I wonder what this cap is for. It's probably for fuel. And then we have a required placard here that tells us what grade of fuel we're allowed to use. Um, so under there is right. So part of our walk around inspection, we would simply open our cap. I have a little dipstick in there that I can uh, kind of act like a straw, stick down in there, put our finger over the top, and I pull it out and it has graduated scale to tell me exactly how much fuel is in there. Um, I also use this cap not only for filling, you know, with gas, but also on the bottom here, we're gonna work our way down here to the bottom. We have another uh, fuel sump. Remember, we had one up there under the uh, engine to sell. Now we have one under the fuel tank. And so what we want to notice is that this sump is actually on the lowest part of the fuel tank that they can install it. And that's just another point right there for us to be able to draw some fuel and make sure that is nice, clean, blue, clear um, fluid. Now, if it was something other than that, then we simply need to uh, investigate why. If it was water, we would just continue to sump once again to make sure we can rid our, ourselves of all that water or any contamination. Uh, so we're underneath the right hand wing at the moment. This is going to be our right hand main gear. Notice we have another wheel pant on there and again just like the nose pant that's there for mainly aesthetics but also it may, it may provide us another couple of miles uh, per hour of cruise speed. Um, I'm going to move my hand here. This is going to be our brake assembly. Notice how small it is. Just like your car it works off of hydraulics as we step on our pedals it's going to route some brake fluid uh, down here to these brake calipers right here that then squeeze on some brake pads onto a brake rotor that we might be able to see. There it is. And through the theory of uh, heat, it simply slows our airplane down by clamping down on that shiny disc right there. Uh, again, we have our chrome uh, plated uh, strut here, and that's going to give us our cushion. So as we come in for a, a real nice hard landing, what's going to happen is this is going to cushion uh, our landing and make it feel just real nice. So what happens, just like uh, on the nose again, we have our rear torque leak right here. This is what provides uh, uh, some directional stability. That's what keeps our wheel from just simply pivoting all the way around our, our chrome strut there. Uh, this black line right there is exactly what I was saying. It re this is our hydraulic uh, hose that feeds hydraulic fluid from our reservoir up there, then to our pedals, and eventually down here to our brake caliper. Um, what else is under here? If we look just above, we have a inspection panel right here. Uh, we're going to notice all along the bottom um, surface of this wing, we're going to have multiple inspection panels that we're able to remove. Uh, that way the professional maintenance folks can uh, get in there with a flashlight and a mirror and check out the entire airplane for any deficiencies that we may need to uh, think about repairing. All right, so as we work our way a little bit further out, we're still gonna stay on the bottom though. We have a little vent right here. So we have this fuel tank is directly above us is where we are. We have a vent right here in the event our um, you know, fuel sloshes around. Sometimes it'll drip out of here. That is not always a bad thing. We just simply have too much fuel. Um, a little bit further out from that, we have this little dome uh, fitting right here. What that does is that provides the maintenance folks a way to interface a 
airplane jack right there and that's a solid lifting point to allow our airplane to then be suspended up in the air for further inspection purposes. Uh, coming out a few more inches we have this ring, this loop right here and that's simply used for securing our airplane down on the ramp in the event we want to park somewhere and we expect some high winds or we're just going to park and walk away for any amount of time. We're going to run a chain, we're going to run a rope, we're going to run a strap of any kind from here and tighten it down to the ground at a uh, particular point. Also forward to that, you can see this fancy GoPro mount right there. I like taking videos when I fly once in a while, so I had a GoPro mount developed and mounted right there, and that provides a good uh, viewing point for folks to watch. Let's see, nothing else on the bottom here. So that pretty well covers the inboard half of our right-hand wing. As we come out a little bit further, we have our wing tip, and we have this fancy green uh, light bulb that's on our right-hand wing tip. Now this one is required by law to be green in color and what that does is it allows other pilots to be able to see me from a distance at night time. The right hand wing is going to be a green bulb, the left hand bulb is going to be a red bulb. What it is for navigational purposes, that way other pilots can see what side of the plane they're looking at from a very far perspective to determine if there's going to be a collision hazard or not. So that's the purpose of why this is green and the left hand light is going to be a red one. Now coming around the back side here. Now we can talk about some of our primary flight controls, one of which is going to be our aileron. This is our right-hand aileron, and this is what controls the, uh, the rolling of the airplane. So in the event that I wanted to roll the airplane to the left, this aileron would actually be deflected down, and the aileron on the left-hand wing is gonna be deflected up. So that gives us a, uh, a rolling moment in the direction that we, that we choose to control with our, with our control yoke. So just inboard of that, we have another uh, secondary flight control now. This is gonna be our flaps. And what, what we use these for is in the event we wish to fly at a slow speed, um, for example, coming in for landing, we typically introduce uh, flaps depending on various conditions. This allows us to fly at a lower uh, speed by creating uh, a higher level of lift that allows us to uh, sustain flight at such a lower speed is what its purpose is. The flap speeds on this airplane, there is a limitation that says we cannot fly above a certain speed uh, for uh, structural purposes, structural failure can occur. The manufacturer says we must be at or below 115 miles per hour uh, for full flaps to be input. Uh, exceeding that speed can damage the airplane. The manufacturer just simply tells us not to do so. Uh, a little bit further inboard, we see we have some black uh, painting. It's actually not painting. Uh, it's going to be like skateboard, skateboard material. It kind of feels like sandpaper, and this just provides us a non-slippery surface. This is how we board the airplane. So we're going to step on a step right here. We have a handle just behind this cargo door right here that we would grab, and then we can then lift ourselves onto the wing walk right here is what it's called. That way we're not slipping on a wet airplane if it just rained. This feels like uh, sandpaper is what it is. Um, so we have our boarding door right here. Piper only gives us one, so I'm going to lift myself up on here and we can take a look at maybe what's inside a Piper Cherokee. So I'm sitting in the left-hand seat. This is typically our captain seat. Uh, there are four seats total. There's going to be two here in the front, one left, one right, and there's a bench seat behind me that can hold two, uh, two more people. Um, so I got a lot of gauges in front of me. So the first thing that most people are going to recognize, we have a control yoke right here, and this is what provides our climbing ability. Uh, as well as our rolling ability. Um, so we talked about our ailerons earlier. If I wanted to roll left, I can roll left this way or that way. Uh, if I pull back, the stabilator on the rear we'll talk about later uh, changes an angle to, to provide any climbs or descents that we, uh, that we wish to make. So if I start from the left-hand side, I have my headset jacks right here. Uh, one is going to be for mic purposes. The other is going to be for audio purposes. Um, starting at the top right here, we have a clock. Um, Airplanes sometimes are required to have a clock for purposes of being able to measure, um, you know, seconds and minutes. Uh, just below that, we have our autopilot. I can, what I can do is I can set up uh, this autopilot to control uh, all aspects of flight, whether I'm climbing, I'm turning, I'm descending, whichever. I can have it do it for me to reduce pilot load. Uh, just below that, we have this intercom. This, this just allows me to control uh, different levels of audio between the, the entire cabin. Uh, down further, I have have placards. These are simply uh, notes that are required by the manufacturer to be installed uh, within the pilot's field of view. And all the way down here we have the shiny knob right there. And this is exactly what we were talking about the primer earlier. What I would do is I would spin this a little bit, uh, pull it out some, and I could inject some gas just like that with you know maybe a, a few different motions like so. Um, this red switch right there is going to be uh, the equivalent of turning the key on on your car. This provides battery power to the entire airplane. Uh, this airplane's really cool. It's push to start. It does not have a, uh, a key to start, although it does utilize a key. This is the button that actually starts the airplane. 
uh, beside it. We'll talk about a little bit later a pitot heat. Uh, what that is, that's going to be the uh, the mast on the left-hand wing that feeds our gauges with its information. This allows us to provide electricity to the to the pitot vane for, um, you know, in the event we get iced up or something, we want to remove some ice so we can generate some heat there. Next one over here is our fuel pump. Uh, we noted earlier we have an electric fuel pump uh, up there with the engine. Uh, the manufacturer says this fuel pump should be used for landing and takeoff purposes or any maneuvers that are going to be done. Uh, next switch inboards are navigational lights. These are going to be the red, the green on our wingtips as well as um, a white light on the tail of our plane. The next switch right here is for our landing light. That's that LED bulb that we pointed out on the nose of the airplane. And finally our last switch is going to be our strobe that's in the on position. I leave that there. That's going to be our red flashy light on the top tail of the plane. And anytime the battery switch is going to be on, that bulb is going to be flashing to warn anybody around me that there's going to be uh, power applied to the airplane and to remain clear because that propeller could, uh, you know, become, become in motion at any, at any point. So back up here to the left, we've covered just about that entire bottom row. Um, this is going to be our turn and slip indicator. We have a uh, kind of a half moon shape uh, indication right there with a little ball that moves in it. And this simply is used to determine if we're flying um, coordinated. What they, and what they mean by that is, is the tail directly behind the nose uh, in a linear form. Uh, also above that we have our um, indication that tells us if we are uh, our rate of turn. So there's something called standard rate of turn is three degrees per second. And this gauge right there is how we determine if we're more or less than that. Above that's an important one is our airspeed indicator. Um, that just tells us simply how fast we're going. Beside that is our attitude indicator. This is what tells us up, down, or if we're banked left or right. This is one of the suction gauges that utilizes that vacuum pump that we talked about earlier. Uh, just below that is our directional gyro. This is the other gauge that uses suction to, uh, to, to function. And this just simply tells us which way we're pointed, like, just like a compass rose. Uh, next gauge is another important one, our altimeter. This simply tells us how high we are or how low we are. Uh, below that, our vertical speed indicator. If we are climbing or if we are descending, this will tell us at what rate we are doing so. That's important because sometimes when you're stuck in the clouds, you don't know which way is up, down, left, right. So this is one of the gauges that we use to cross-check to determine our orientation in flight that we cannot see the ground in. Um, these two gauges right here I'll talk about simultaneously. These are um, nav indicators or VOR indicators. We use these uh, in the event we're flying in indications that we cannot see. We use these gauges uh, to be able to help us find the runways when we, again, we just cannot see. Um, some circuit breakers for different electrical systems. We have uh, a couple of switches right here that feed power to our avionics, which are in that center stack right here. I'll get to in just a second. Um, more power switches. We have an AP level button. Uh, this autopilot has a cool feature where if I'm in flight that I'm maybe I'm panicking or I've lost myself uh, in terms of space, I don't, I'm, I'm disoriented, I can hit this blue button and the autopilot will take over and actually make myself wings level, straight and level flight. So I'm not climbing, I'm not descending, I'm safe, I can kind of take a breather uh, from there. This red button right there, if the autopilot is uh, controlling me in flight right now, I can simply push and hold that and it will disengage the autopilot servo so that I can make an adjustment to flight. And then as soon as I release, the autopilot will then take back over. Uh, down from there, I mentioned the airplane does utilize a key. So I have a key that will stick in there. We have uh, a placard there that has off, right, left, and both is what that means. And that's gonna be talking about our magnetos up front. Remember we said we got two magnetos, left and right. Manufacturer for this airplane says we're gonna start on the left magneto and then once the engine does fire, then we'll select it onto both. And this is going to be used uh, momentarily when we're at the run-up pad, right? Just before takeoff, we do what's called a run-up, and we cycle between the two magnetos. And what we're looking for is indication on our uh, uh, engine to make sure that both, both magnetos are going to be operating correctly. Uh, beside that, it's going to be our carb heat control. Remember we talked about in the event we suspect carburetor icing, we can pull this, and it'll reroute some uh, heated air into the carburetor to get rid of that icing. Uh, next, we have our throttle control. This is, this is simply the accelerator pedal like on your car. So if I push this knob all the way in, that's going to give the uh, airplane uh, as much power as we can get out of it. Uh, beside that, I've got a, uh, a power source to be able to run, you know, maybe a phone charger if I wish, things like that. Uh, the next knob right here is uh, another redundant feature that's really cool about this airplane. It has a standby vacuum. So that vacuum pump, if it were to fail, then this provides a mean to uh, reroute some other vacuum sources on the motor to these two gauges that I really need to operate, especially in uh, a flight that I just cannot see if it's you know cloudy, foggy, what have you. Uh, moving over further, we have this red knob right there. 
what that red knob does is it controls how much uh, fuel is then delivered to the engine. And what we do is uh, as we climb in, in, in space, the air, you think about when you climb Mount Everest, right? You got people that don't take oxygen and, and they simply pass out from lack of oxygen. Uh, what that means is that the, uh, the air is simply less dense, right? So when you have less dense air, you require less uh, fuel for combustion to be, um, to be proper. So basically what I mean is as we climb, we can reduce the amount of fuel that the engine is then ingesting. Beside that, we have some uh, buttons. This is going to be for our emergency uh, locator, our ELT beacon. In the event I crash, there's, there's going to be a beacon that is automatically triggered and then sent off for search and rescue exercises to commence. I have ways to uh, turn that on manually and, and turn it off manually as well. Uh, two knobs beside that is going to be knobs to control the amount of lighting that I provide to the panel uh, during night operations. Two more shiny lever levers next to that are going to be for uh, providing heat and our defrost uh, to the airplane in the event we get cold or we have a foggy windscreen. Uh, above that, this rectangular avionics box right there is our transponder. What happens is I'm going to type a code in there and what happens is air traffic controller is able to assign information to that code so that they know where I want to go. They see, based off this box, they see how high I am, any kind of information that they want to assign to me anytime I am airborne. This square box right here, um, carbon monoxide detector. These aren't very good. I also run a digital one as well, but this provides um, a real-time indication of uh, if you have a dangerous level of carbon monoxide present within the airplane. Uh, some various engine uh, indications right here. Oil pressure is an important one. Anytime we fall below 60 uh, during flight at a cruise RPM, the manufacturer says that is cause for inspection. Um, our fuel pressure here, you can see we have a very wide window of what's acceptable as noted by the green range there. Nonetheless, our fuel pressure should always remain above zero. Uh, oil temperature as well. Typically, we operate anywhere from 180 to 200. Uh, any, anytime it's above that, that is also a cause for inspection. Uh, we have two fuel level gauges. Remember we said we got two fuel tanks. We got one on the left and we got one on the right. Um, the reason it's nice to have two fuel gauges, this engine uh, only consumes fuel out of one or the other at, an, at any given time. And that's controlled by, uh, with a fuel selector that I'll point out here in a moment. And what I can do is I can reference these fuel gauges to make sure I have an equal amount of fuel roughly in each wing. Otherwise, if I don't, I simply have a, an airplane that likes to turn in the direction of the heavy wing because it simply has too much fuel. Above that is our tachometer. This simply is how many RPMs are we spinning. And I control that to set, uh, you know, climb power, cruise power, things like that. Um, go from the top down. This is our audio panel. And there's a lot of, but there's a lot of buttons on it. Uh, top row, bottom row, as, as well as a knob. This is how I control what audio am I listening to in my headset, as well as which radio am I talking through. And that's controlled with the knob here. So that's our audio panel. Things like uh, I can listen to ATC there. I can listen to um, Morse codes there. Sometimes you have to identify different stations that we have to listen to for approach purposes. Uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of different things we can listen to, and this is how we control that. Just below that, we have what's called a Garmin GNS430. This is my uh, GPS. This is how I fly around. Sometimes um, uh, approaches can be flown from this as well. Nonetheless, this is how we navigate. Uh, this box here is going to be our engine monitor. It is a JPI EDM730. This is where I can display the cylinder temps, exhaust gas temperature, uh, RPM, um, you know, electronic voltage if my alternator fails, for example. Um, all my engine indications are going to be embedded in that screen there. Uh, the, bottom, the bottom radio right here is going to be our second radio and our second nav receiver. Um, this is used in, sometimes I can listen to two frequencies at one time. Uh, that is actually done just about every flight. Uh, as well as the second half of this device allows us to tune in a second um, navigational frequency. And that is going to be displayed on this bottom indicator. So this bottom indicator is for our nav 2 radio and the top indicator is used for our nav 1 radio. And that's pretty easy to not mistake there. Another thing to note in this cockpit right here is we talked about the uh, fuel selector right here by my left hand foot. Uh, it's red, it has our placard, so right now we are selected to consume fuel from the right hand tank. And there it is again, we're placarded at 25 gallons use, uh, total. And then what happens if I want to start consuming fuel out of our left hand tank, I simply grab this lever right there and I bring it over until I feel a click. There have been instances where sometimes this gets stuck somewhere in between and now fuel is actually not flowing from either tank. And then what happens is, is fuel starvation. Um, the remedy for that is actually pretty easy. You just go back to one side, as long as it has fuel, give it about 10 seconds and it'll actually, you know, resume normal, uh, normal flight. Uh, so a little bit below that, let me get my leg out of the way here. 
This is where that cooling air is going to be routed into the cabin right here. And I have a control right there that allows me to close off or open up how much of that air is brought in from the leading edge of the wings right there. Um, I'm going to come up some. I've got a elastic pouch right here. What I keep in here is my laminated checklist. And this checklist is going to use for just about all, all aspects of flight. Uh, anywhere from I just showed up at the... Uh, the airplane and I need to do my initial uh, pre-flight inspection that's going to be done here uh, tells us things that we look at we're kind of go over, going over a lot of that right now um, things I need to do before start there's a whole bunch of different phases um, of flight that, that have us reference uh, into this checklist but most importantly there's going to be a section in here of what to do in an emergency so if I have an engine failure just after takeoff um, first thing I want to do is uh, establish my, uh, my best glide speed and in this airplane it's going to be about 85 miles per hour and that simply allows us to fly for the most amount of distance in a given amount of time and then I would reference our checklist and say okay here's some things I can do to perhaps remedy that um, that's just one example of some emergency procedures that are included in our, in our checklist here so there's that uh, just above that I've got this uh, door right here that I can swing down a lot of times on the ground I get hot especially in the summer here in Texas so I'll open that door right there and there's an additional little scoop that I can extend out there and that's just a scoop to bring in some more additional air right there for me or anybody else that's in the cabin that may find it to be a little bit warm and typically before I pull it on the runway for takeout purposes I can close that it is allowed to fly with that window open during flight however I found it's not really effective at doing anything other than creating a whole bunch of noise um, I guess we can go over things on top now um, so above all of our instrument panel now we're kind of looking outside uh, this right here this little device with the two antennas on it simply allows me a way to see in-flight weather updates as well as any other traffic that's around me um, and I can display all that on my tablet that I carry we have a magnetic compass right here as we can see it's currently indicating we're looking due west right now uh, that's what that's used for and this compass is used in flight to simply uh, calibrate this directional gyro we mentioned earlier that way I can see which direction I'm going um, above that we have a couple of different visors right here these can be rotated a little bit to determine on where the depending on where the Sun is kind of peeking through we can rotate these to block out a little bit of that Sun uh, also just above that if we can get in there we have a thermometer and sometimes in the winter months uh, that's important because if we're flying in temperature at or below freezing invisible moisture like a cloud that those are the only two ingredients that require icing to develop on an airplane this airplane is not certified for flight in a known icing conditions um, so typically we don't fly on those kind of days like we just had um, there is no remedy to shed ice on this airplane our only safety is to um, apply pedo heat and all that's going to do is protect these three gauges so we're going to have uh, our airspeed will still be reliable our altimeter and our vertical speed and we'll go talk about our pedo uh, mass here momentarily so above uh, above our windscreen here we've got this uh window crank looking thing here and that's exactly what it is it's a crank to control our our nose up or nose down trim so what happens is at different phases or at different speeds that we can cruise at there's going to be a certain amount of pressure that that the pilots must maintain either forward pressure or backwards pressure on this control yoke and we don't want to we don't want to fly around for long periods of time having to hold this yoke in a given spot so what we can do is we can turn this uh this crank in whichever direction that allows us to then fly what's called hands off then the flight then the plane just wants to maintain equilibrium it does whatever you want to whatever you left it doing last so that's our overhead tr uh, trim right there we also have an additional trim we have our rudder trim here as a knob and that simply controls the rudder on the tail of the plane we can turn it left we can turn it right uh, and that's controlled with this knob right here and that's in between uh, the, the pilot and the co-pilot's feet right there if we go down a little bit and back some we have a handle right here and this is a lever that we can raise and lower in three different notches this controls our flaps on the wings there we have three settings we have 10 degrees we have 25 degrees and that third notch there is going to be 40 degrees so at different speeds as we slow down through we can input more or less flaps depending on what the pilot is is, is looking to do uh, we notice on the co-pilot side we have another uh, way to input some more cooling air into the cabin right there and they have a knob as well that they can shut that off or open it up all the way um, additionally the rear seats actually have their own cooling air vents as well so there's four total vents there's two in the front one on each side and there's two in the back one on each side so we have four total vents that are bringing in 125 miles per hour roughly of air from the outside to the inside 
Um, that's about what this plane cruises at. Everything is measured on these old planes in miles per hour. The moder more modern ones measure in, uh, in knots, right? Knots. Um, this plane, if I'm down low, let's say 5,000 foot of elevation and below, I typically plan to cruise about about 125 to 130 miles per hour, and that's about 110 knots is the equivalent. Um, if I'm up high, if I'm going really far, maybe I'm 10,000 feet or so, is about the extent that this plane, you know, in terms of performance, is, is willing to go. But then I plan on closer to about 120 knots, and that's closer to about 140 miles per hour. And at those speeds is about nine gallons per hour. And that's important for fuel planning purposes, because again, we don't like to run out of fuel when we're flying, right? Um, down here with my feet, these are the pedals, and this is actually how I would control um, movement on the ground. So if I want to go left, I push left. If I want to go right, I push right. Uh, we also have these paddles kind of up higher that I have my toes on, and these are going to be our brakes. If I want to apply the right-hand brake, I can apply that independently of the left-hand brake, and vice versa with the left brake, I can apply that independently. And sometimes it helps us turn a little bit better on the ground. If I apply the left brake only, that'll help pivot the nose wheel around to that left-hand turn in the event we need to turn sharply. That is a way to do so. Uh, one additional handle that I missed right here, this guy here, this is gonna be our parking brake. Uh, I've actually got it set right now. I can unset it for demonstration purposes. So right now the wheels are gonna be unlocked. We can roll around if we wanted to. The way we set this is we simply pull back. We press this lever with our thumb and we release. Now the brake is set. That's all it takes. Now the, now the plane's locked in, in motion. We cannot move anywhere. So that was a general look on what's going on inside this Piper Cherokee 180, but we've got a little bit more to cover. So first thing I want to do is now we've made it back outside the airplane. Here's the, uh, the cargo space, we call it. So we have this one little door that we can open, and that is locked via key. Um, so we have this little bungee strap right there that just holds it in an open position so we're not banging our heads while we're loading the wife's, uh, the wife's baggage, right? So inside here, this, uh, this space has the ability to hold up to 200 pounds. Um, I actually have in these ammo cans, I've got 100 pounds, uh, 50 of, of in each. And and what this does, that's just simply some ballast weight. Uh, I've found that these Piper Cherokees tend to be uh, a little bit nose heavy by default. And so what I've done is I've just added some weight in the back to give it a little bit more ideal flight characteristics. And I've found that to be very helpful. So anybody with these Piper Cherokees, I highly recommend at least 100 pounds in this cargo space. And they tend to fly a little bit better. And uh, actually a little bit more faster as well. If you look into the aerodynamics behind it, you get, gain a few, uh, few knots of airspeed there. Uh, so that's our cargo space. Uh, if we look on top, we're going to have some different antennas, maybe another vent or so. Um, that biggest scoop right there, kind of midway back, that's going to be our uh, vent inside the cabin uh, on the overhead. That's a vent that we can open or close uh, to allow any extracted heat to come out if we wish. Uh, we have a common antenna right here. We've got another common antenna here. And these are on the top of the uh, fuselage there, and that allows me to hear things through radios. We've got another antenna right here. This is going to be our ELT antenna. Again, anytime we uh, we crash or I, or I wish to uh, exercise maybe a emergency search function, I can energize my ELT, and this is the antenna that transmit that beacon on a certain frequency that air traffic controllers, any airlines will then hear a beacon. They can come, uh, you know, look for me based off where the signal is originating from. Uh, a little bit further back, we have our stabilator, is what this is called. Some airplanes just call them elevator. Uh, the Piper Cherokee uses a stabilator, which means this entire thing actually moves. So as I pull back on the yoke inside, this is the action that occurs. As I push down on the yoke inside, this is the result that we get from that. On the aft portion of that, we see this tab here. And this is our trim tab, so that overhead crank we talked about, that, that is controlling this tab. We can raise and lower that tab with our overhead crank. Uh, coming a little bit further, uh, now we have our vertical stabilizer. On the aft portion of that, we have our we have our rudder. So our foot pedals control our rudder uh, on the ground, but also in flight. And this is how we control if we are in coordinated flight again. Uh, and that's just simply, again, our nose is, is directly in front of our tail, and our tail is directly behind our nose. Planes can fly sideways, although it's not ideal. Uh, so there's our rudder. This is our vertical stabilizer. On the top of it, we have two more antennas. These are our nav antennas that receive uh, uh, any navigational frequency information that we have selected. And the very top there, we have a red and white flashy light, and that's going to be our beacon. That's the one that's on anytime the battery is energized, and we can uh, warn anybody else in the vicinity that uh, there's power applied to the airplane to look out for, for safety hazards. So one more thing that's to note on the top of these vertical stabil uh, stabilizers, we have a clear lens right here. This is going to be our white uh, bulb. That's going to be something that is on constantly anytime our nav lights are illuminated. So with our nav light switch, we have a red bulb on the left wing. We have a 
green bulb on the right wing and then the white bulb is going to be on our tail. And again, that's for purposes of other pilots at nighttime to be able to determine if they're going to have a collision hazard with another airplane at nighttime. Um, so this is the other side of the stabilator. Looks just the same as the right hand side. Uh, moving around to the tail. All airplanes typically have a data plate on them. Uh, they're in different locations. The manufacturer likes to hide them on us. This simply tells us what kind of plane it is, what certification it's certified under, the serial number, things like that. Uh, the tail number is typically painted on both sides of the airplane. It is the same left and right, I promise. Um, the left hand flap moves just like the right hand flap does. They are connected with one big long torque tube that prevents one from moving without the other. The entire left hand wing is going to be one mirror image of what's going on on the right hand wing with the exception of one item and that's going to be underneath our pedo mast or our pedo vane some call it. And what this does is as we're flying through the air what this guy does is it uses the ram air effect and we have an inlet on the front here that takes some of that air and it routes it to our airspeed indicator to tell us how fast are we flying through the air. Uh, we also have a little tiny hole on the back of it that feeds some static information to our other gauges like how high we are, uh, if we're climbing or if we're descending. Um, and again, this is, this is something that is prone to picking up ice if we are in uh, icing conditions. Uh, so to be able to remove that, we can engage a switch that routes electricity out here, makes this guy really hot so we can melt that ice off and still have um, gauges that we can fly to to get us out of that icing situation. So as we move on to the leading edge of the wing here, there's one other thing that's different. We have this little guy right here on the leading edge right there that I can lift with my finger and we can listen for an audible click. That's an electronic switch. So as we're flying and, and as we're slowing down, if we wish to maintain um, you know, the same altitude, what we have to do is constantly pick the nose up to increase what's called our angle of attack. Uh, that's going to be the angle of the airplane in relation to the relative wind which we're flying through. As we increase that angle of attack, we approach closer and closer to stall speed. And what this switch is, uh, is job to do right there is to uh, tell us when we're approaching that stall speed. So at a predetermined speed, close to 55 miles per hour and below, this switch will actually illuminate a light bulb inside to tell us, hey, we're getting too close to the critical angle of attack, we're getting ready to stall. So we just have a, a little safety switch there for that. Stall indicator is what that's gonna be called. Um, Another cooling air inlet on the left-hand wing root right there. This is going to be that vent on the pilot's left-hand foot. Uh, it also branches off further back in the wing to feed uh, a rear seat left-hand side cooling air vent as well. So here we go. We've just done a really good in-depth thorough walk around of this Piper Cherokee 180. Uh, they still make them today. There have been some improvements. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, it's been fun and here's a Piper Cherokee.